Now, back live with Jones and Credlin. Yeah, thank you for being with us. Peter's in Melbourne, but we have asked both of us, Barnaby Joyce, onto the program tonight for a variety of reasons. In the interest of good government, and a government which the public elected less than a year ago, some of the nonsense being talked about Barnaby Joyce needs to be dismantled. That Barnaby Joyce is a wrecker, that Barnaby Joyce can't cop the fact that he lost a leadership contest last week, that Barnaby Joyce is now going to lead a ginger group to make life difficult for the Morrison government, that Barnaby Joyce puts personal ambition above his team and his government, that Barnaby Joyce is a destabiliser. Notwithstanding that Barnaby Joyce has made a couple of very simple points, and I quote, I want to work with my colleagues to make sure that we give ourselves the very best chance to thrive and surprise as a political party. He said we're being attacked on all sides, whether it's shooters and fishers, whether it's one nation or whether it's independent. Unquote. Well, make no mistake, the National Party is fighting for its life. In politics, as in life, you look at the scoreboard. Well, have a look at the scoreboard at the last election for the National Party, the seat of Calaire, Blue Ribbon National, a massive swing against the National Party, 17% to the shooters. Cowper, the Nationals didn't even win the primary vote. They only won the seat on preferences. In Indy, I remember my dear old friend Mac Halton. It was once Blue Ribbon Nationals. They didn't get within cooey of the seat. It went to the Independent. Gippsland, the shooters and fishers won 7% of the vote. Blue Ribbon National Party. Labor Party, 3%. Clive Palmer got 4.4%. Mally, this is astonishing. Ann Webster's trying to change the party's rules in relation to a spill motion. In other words, you can't propose to declare all leadership positions vacant unless you get two-thirds of the party's support. So she thinks this is Vladimir Putin stuff. Anne Webster? Well, she might have won the seat of Mali. Her primary vote was 27.9%. The swing against the Nationals was 28%. This is the McCormack scoreboard. The Nationals can't survive another route like this. Parks? Well, Parks had to go to preferences for the first time in living memory. In the West Australian Senate, the McCormack-led Nationals received a lower vote than the Hemp Party, Help End Marijuana Prohibition. That mob won 1.7% of the vote, the Nationals got 1.4%. And in Tasmania, the National Party lost their Senator, Steve Martin. The leader then recommends to the Prime Minister who should represent the party in the Ministry, and Barnaby Joyce and Matt Canavan, its two outstanding performers, don't get a Guernsey. McCormack only chose those people who voted for him, so who is destabilising the government and the National Party? I'll tell you who. His name's Michael McCormack. Peter and I travel the bush. We've both been everywhere in the last six months through drought and bushfires. In the bush, they've never heard of McCormack. But they say there are two people who can breathe life back into the party. Two people who can bring once National Party voters back to the National Party. That's what the issue is here. And make no mistake, if that doesn't happen at the next election, Scott Morrison can't win. It's McCormack who is the albatross around the government's neck. Barnaby Joyce last week responded to calls in Voterland to turn this around. Well, of course, McCormack held the whip hand. He had trophies to give out. A cabinet spot here, a ministry there, the deputy leadership somewhere else. And as my old man used to say, in the race of life, self-interest will always start favourite. Lou O'Brien, a former policeman turned Wide Bay Federal MP, quit the National Party on Sunday night. He also had a shouting match with McCormack who keeps making excuses over his failure to lead. Lou O'Brien is loyal to the Nationals and loyal to the government, but no one should be expected to be loyal to incompetence. One National Party member wrote to me yesterday, and this is what they said. he said, this is the most lacklustre, mis mischievous and untrustworthy National Party leader in living memory. Well, I'd say you most probably have to be all of those things if you're incompetent. It's the only way to survive. Barnaby Joyce joins us from Canberra. Barnaby Joyce, thank you for your time. You're welcome, Alan. What do you make yeah. of all these arguments? And you voted yesterday to uh, knock off the government's nominee as deputy speaker, and you're destabilising, and you're a ginger group. What do you make of all this? We're doing our very best to make sure that the government, the Morrison government, remains in power. That's that's the outcome I want. That's the outcome I'm fighting for. I've given most of my life, my adult life, to make sure that. Uh, you know, I didn't join any other party but the National Party. I joined it in Charleville. I believe in the ethos of the National Party that a person can start at the bottom, Alan and Peter, and transcend through the economic and social stratification of life to their highest level, limited only by their innate ability. And the most likely place they'll do that if they're not born with the money and they're not born with the education and they're not born with the backing of a, you know, a strong family name, they'll probably do it through small business. 
That's the sort of party I believe in. And I talk about it when I talk about the weatherboard and iron. The weatherboard and iron house. The house that we have to re reflect on and look at the people inside and say they are the people we're in, there, we're in there to fight for. And that's the only people I'm in there to fight for. And that's what I'll continue to fight for. And I wish Michael all the very, very best. And I want uh, Mr Morrison to win the next election because I am very concerned about a nation that is led by a government whose principles are ones of, of quashing, of, of the, the, the inspiration that should come from the person who wants to get ahead in life, who wants to make a break of it, who doesn't want to be tied up in government regulation, who wants to have the capacity not to wear the corporate uniform but to wear their own uniform, to live by their own corporate manual. That's just the kind of nation that I want and I will fight for it and uh, if, if Michael can take us there, then good on Michael and I'll, I'll support Michael if, uh, and I hope Mr Morrison can do the same. But, but that, that's, uh, just you know, to interrupt I'm, you there, Barnaby, just, just to interrupt you there and Peter, the point I think we're making is that put Scott, this is Scott Morrison's got a stake in this because if the National Party have these kinds of swings against them at the next election and seats are lost and they're now on the margins now and Barnaby's hearing this, you and I are hearing this in the bush when we went to Dirham yeah. Mandy and everywhere, then Scott Morrison yeah. can't win government. That's the guts of it here, Barnaby. Yeah, look, I, I understand that, Alan. I, I, I've got ears, and you, you are not respecting the voter if you don't tell them what you're hearing whilst you walk down Peel Street. You're not respecting the voter if you don't tell them what you're hearing when you're walking to the corner pub at St George. You're not respecting the voter if you don't tell them what you're hearing when you're walking through the streets of Charters Towers or when you're walking up the street of uh, Rockhampton. You, you've got to listen to people and you've got to reflect on it. You've got to take your medicine. And, I, you know, when they dish out your medicine, you've got to accept it and you've got to reflect on it and you've got to do a better job. In this time where people are dealing with bushfires, they're dealing with, with, with droughts, now some of them are dealing with floods, and they're dealing with the bank manager screaming at them, screaming at them that they want their account squared up. They want to make sure that uh, they don't have to answer to credit bureau and explain why their account is out of, a, is, is out of order, in arrears. They're, they're looking for strong National Party voice, a strong, unequivocal National Party voice. And I respect uh, the role of the Liberal Party. And it's funny you brought up uh, Isabella Marion Dor Dorothea McKellar. That was her name. She actually lived at Point Piper. She lived at Point Piper, had a house on Pittswater. She was reflecting on her time at her brother's place near Gunnedah. And she wrote it at the age of 19, homesick in England, about my country and, uh, and that the issue is there that we have this symbiotic relationship that's got to be understood between the urban areas and the country and, and, and it's great that you brought up my country and Dorothea McKellar because that is a classic example of it, the understanding of regional areas from an urban constituency and the role of the National Party is to make sure that that rural constituency, those people on the weatherboard nine, are well and truly heard and mm -hmm. fought for. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do that, then Pauline Hanson's One Nation, yeah. Shoes and Fishers, yeah, Independence. Well, can I just Peter. take Peter. you yes, of course, Peter. Mm. Yeah, I mean, Barnaby, the problem as I see it for the National Party is you are at risk on one side of Pauline Hanson, who has not gone away, and she's got two iterations of, of her party now putting pressure on the National Party vote. On the other side, it's, it's a number of simple arithmetic. There are more seats held by Liberals in regional Australia mm -hmm. than there is seats held by the National Party. Now, we saw at the March election, the state election in New South Wales uh, last year, that you were really giving a, a, a smack around the seats that you didn't lose by the, to the shooters and fishers, that they were seats that were that were under real pressure and big swings against the National Party. I've got to say, under Michael McCormack, you're in serious trouble of long-term, medium-term decline. Does anybody out there in the rank and file of the National Party understand how dire it is for your brand? Well, of course we understand. I'm, I'm not a fool. I mean, I know, look, I'm very, very, very lucky. I, I, I grew up in a basically a hillbilly area and I went and got a Jesuit education so um, I, was, I was very lucky, I had a good family and they gave me a good education but I see the people handing out the how to vote cards and I know them because I grew up with them and you know when you go to the ballot box and you see people you know handing out for shooters and fishers and you know them you say uh, what's going on and they say oh you, you know they call me Joycey, they say Joycey you're alright mate but you know we're just you know we're, they're politically engaged you got to understand 
You might see the house and you might disregard it. You might see that little house, but you have a look in the window. They've got the Australian flag f flying and you know hanging up in their window. They're proud of themselves, yeah. and they do have a political mind and they do want to be listened to. So when and you say listen, when you say listen, when you say listen, then what are the things that they are wanting you as the National Party to achieve for them? What are the issues that they const they talk to Peter and I all the time about it? I mean, they bailed us up at Durham Bandy, wherever we've been, bailed us up at Winton. We hear it. What are they telling you needs to be done? OK, we'll go through a couple of them. First of all, they don't want the government all over their, all over their, all their lives. These people do go out, uh, they shoot at a recreation. They don't want the government telling them everything they have to do, getting a licence or a permit for every time they scratch themselves, every time they knock over a tree, every time they take a shot at a, a roo or a rabbit. They, they, don't, they want the government to understand that they deserve a mobile phone reception just like everybody else. They want the government to have big vision, big vision. Talk about bringing water from the north of Australia down to the south, the Bradfield scheme. You talk to them about that, and by gosh, you've got their attention. They will listen to yeah, you. Yeah, but Barney, I've got to jump in there, Barney. I've got to jump in there. You, you, you have been in power for seven years. You and I in opposition mm -hmm. had our hands all over. A hundred dams was the plan. You were the deputy yeah. prime minister. Uh, show me where the dams are. Like, wh what has the well, coalition can done? Can you understand why people are angry? Yeah, I can understand why they're angry and I'll go through the explanation and also add to it and say what we have done. I can say to you that if we hadn't extended Chaffee Dam in Tamworth, Tamworth would have run out of water. And I remember when Tony Abbott was the Prime Minister, Greg Hunt was the Environment Minister, grab, literally, literally grabbing him in the corridor and walking him into Tony Abbott's office and saying, we can't get this dam extended because of the Burralong frog. The Burralong frog. Now, I thought if we built a dam... With more water, the frog would be happy. We'd have happy frogs. <laughs> but we needed the environmental offset, the environmental <laughs> offset to get, to, get, to get this dam built. And then we had a road, Peter, between Weabonga, which is a place where people live, not what people do, to Tamworth. And that road fell into the creek, Peter. You know why we couldn't, ex we couldn't fix that road up? Burralong frog. This frog is, an, is a national threat. But we finally got, because Tony Abbott pulled rank, on, uh, at the time, Greg Hunt and said, this is BS, let's get this dam built. We got that dam built, went from 60,000 megalitres to 103,000 megalitres. If that dam hadn't been extended, the city of Tamworth would have run out of water. You've got 60,000 people, 150 litres a day. You look at it, that's one and a half coal trains of water a day that have to be carting to that city. What about city coal, Barnaby? That dam. Coal. Well, what we've got to understand is that it's our nation's uh, biggest export, and let's make sure that we clearly get our, uh, get our philosophy right on this. If you're going to export it, if it's your biggest export, your biggest export earner, then surely you have an obligation to show the world how you can use it in the most efficient way. You should show the world how you can build a coal-fired power station that uses the least amount of coal for the greatest amount of energy and export with your coal that product to the world. And that will really have an effect on global emissions. And whilst you're at it, Ask yourself this question, why do we dig up uranium out of the ground, semi-process it into yellow cake, take it through the middle of town, load it on a ship, send it overseas, Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, whoever, use it for their power plants, and now we're talking to them, even the Labor Party in South Australia, talking to them about bringing back the waste, the waste product, burying it back in Australia. Why don't you use it yourself? Mm. Why don't we have the vision to say, let's turn the corner. If we're going to go through all, all the, the sections of this product, Let's use it ourselves. Let's show the world how we're the smartest users of this technology. We have a nuclear reactor in Australia. It is bang smack in the geographic centre of a place called Little Town. You might have heard of it, Sydney. And the other day they sold blocks of lands so at the end of that nuclear reactor, a million dollars a block. So I think that's the public speaking with their wallet about how they think about this technology. Good on you, Barnaby. Well, it's good to talk to you. We could talk all night. Um, at the end of the day, I just think the people in the bush want someone like Barnaby to prosecute those ideas. Uh, Barney Bell, thank you. I just want to yarn to Peter about you. You can stay listening to her. Peter, this is the issue where we go, isn't it? You bet I they, will. They just feel as though... Well, they just feel as though there is no one to prosecute that argument. And there are two people, I think, that can do it. Uh, Barnaby Joyce and Matt Canavan. Matt's in the Senate. Barnaby's in the, in the lower house. Uh, that's the problem, isn't it, if you're going to bring the Nationals back, back into the National Party? 
And there's got to be a difference in the two brands inside the coalition for the coalition to be strong and for there to be uh, more seats in an election that go the coalition or centre right's way than not. Mm. Uh, the big issue, and I grew up in a National Party seat, I grew up in the seat of the Mallee, the one that had the big swing against it to uh, the new incoming member. So, so I understand in the marrows of my bone the National Party voter. The problem is right now they've become so morphed with Liberals, no one mm. knows where the line is between the National Party ending and the Liberal Party starting. And I agree with Barnaby, what they need is a leader that does something that's dramatic, like yeah. backing yes, uranium, well, like demanding coal-fired power stations um, well, your and actually getting them done. Was well, your leader, Tony Abbott, who said this is the best retail politician in the country, Barnaby Joyce, and we just heard tonight why. And the National Party supporters watching this program out there are cheering. That's what they tell us and that's what they want. We thank Barnaby for joining us. Uh, we've got a very interesting story afterwards about this coronavirus, which is a, a big concern. We'll actually go outside Japan onto one of the ships and talk to some people who are just locked up in a room and can't go anywhere. Stay with us after the break. On Sky News, this is Jones and Credling.